Thank you all very much for joining us, and please join me in welcoming Stephen Moore. It is a great, great privilege to be with you here tonight in the great, great, great state of Kansas. Um, when, uh, when Dave called me, I call him the great and powerful Dave. Uh, when he called me and asked me to come to Kansas City, I said yes instantly because we had such a fun time about six months ago in Wichita when, when uh, we had an event out there. And I just, I had the most wonderful reception in Kansas when I came to Wichita. I, I got off the plane late at night, uh, the night before, very tired, walking through the terminal of the Wichita airport, and this lovely woman, she just runs up to me and she just throws her arms around me. She's so excited to see me, and, and I thought, God, this is a wonderful <laughs> reception in Kansas. And, and this woman who I had never seen before, she, she looks up at me, and she's just beaming, and she says, hey, I know you, don't I? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know, ma'am. And she said, she was so adorable. She said, I'm sure I've seen you on TV. <laughs> and I thought I would tease her a little bit. So I said, well, I'm not sure, ma'am. I said, what do you want? And that kind of, that kind of flummoxed her a little bit. And uh, she kept looking up at me. And then finally the light bulb went on. And she said, wait a minute. She said, didn't I see you on Wheel of Fortune last week? <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, that was me. But um, that was a great introduction to Kansas. I, I, let me just start by saying this. The most important thing is that I'm such a big believer in what the Kansas Policy Institute does. This is a instrumental organization that is um, doing such great work in the state. And, you know, I, I travel around this great country of ours, and um, I do a lot of work with the state think tanks. And this is one of the areas where our movement as free market conservatives, we have such an advantage over the left because we have built this infrastructure around the country. I think Dave doesn't, I think virtually every state now in the country has a conservative state think tank like Kansas Policy Institute. One of the things that's so exciting uh, is that these institutes are making such a dramatic impact. And Kansas Policy Institute is a perfect example of that. And one of the things you have to realize that I've come to discover is that when you go to uh, state capitals and, and the members of the legislature who are here, so I'm so honored to, to be speaking to you tonight, um, you know this, that when you're in the legislature, everyone comes into your office. Same thing in Congress, by the way. Everyone comes to you and they want something, right? They want money. Right? That's why people go to the legislature. I mean, that's why people go to the state capitol to ask the legislature for money for this cause and that cause. One of my favorite uh, presidents of all time, Calvin Coolidge, had one of the greatest themes, you know, uh, he had a little uh, placard on his desk that said 90% of the people who come to Washington want something they shouldn't have, <laughs> right? And that is the same thing in the state capitol here uh, in Kansas. And what, what is so important about, and by the way, most of the organizations that, uh, that lobby for money on the left are funded by government are funded by government, right? And so they use government taxpayer money to lobby for more, even more taxpayer money. And one of the things that's so special uh, about groups like Kansas Policy Institute is they do what they do with the awesome research and the awesome analysis and the testimony and all of the other things that they do without a penny of government money. They depend on people like yourselves uh, and your goodwill to uh, support, and your generosity, obviously, to support this organization. Now, one of the things I always say as a conservative, like everyone in this room, I was extraordinarily downcast and demoralized about what happened in the election in November. Um, you know, four more years of Barack Obama, it's tough to live with, uh, although I'm an editorial page writer, so I always say that, you know, Barack Obama as an editorial page writer is the gift that just keeps giving, right? I mean, there's no shortage of things to write about when Barack Obama is, uh, is in the White House. But, but, you know, one of the things that I think we all have to do as conservatives uh, and, and donors to conservative causes is really look at are the organizations that I'm giving my you know, time and money and energy to, are they moving the needle? Are they changing the direction of things? And I can tell you with all certainty that if you want bang for your buck, please continue to support this very, very instrumental organization because it is kind of a lone wolf. I always describe Kansas Policy Institute as this kind of island of sanity in a sea of socialism in the state capitol. So thank you again for, for everything that you do, Dave, and all your able staff. My day job is 
uh, is working at the Wall Street Journal. How many of you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page? Pretty. I don't care if you read the news pages, but I hope you will read the editorial page. Um, I always tell young people, I give probably you know, 10 to 20 lectures on college campuses a year. And the one thing I always tell these young people, and I'll tell the same thing to you all, is that if you want to be the smartest person in the room, this is a very self-serving thing to say, but I think it's true. If you want to be the smartest person in the room when you're having your Starbucks coffee in the morning, Right, Nestor? Just take 10 or 15 minutes and read those three editorials in the Wall Street Journal. Um, we cover everything from finance to politics to events around the world, uh, and it's just a great way to know about the important events that are happening and, and how you should think about these things. So uh, I'm really proud to be at the Wall Street Journal. Um, the journal, by the way, you know, most of you probably know the newspaper business is a pretty tough industry right now, right? You know, daily newspapers are going out of business, and you know, we're down to five major newspapers in the country today. There's the Wall Street Journal, there's the New York Times, there's the Los Angeles Times, uh, the Washington Post, and the USA Today. And out of those five newspapers, ladies and gentlemen, only one of them, only one of them is making money. Anybody want to take a guess at what paper that is? It is the Wall Street Journal, so we're very proud of that. Uh, but I have, but look, wait, wait, wait. I have even better news than that. I don't know how many of you have looked recently at the financials for the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times, but those two newspapers, they're about this close to being in federal bankruptcy court, and it just couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. <laughs> so uh, that is very good news. And then, of course, um, as many of you know, Rupert Murdoch, about two or three years ago, bought the Wall Street Journal, which is the best thing that ever happened to us. So now we're part of the News Corps family, and we're, our sister organization is obviously Fox, Fox News. How many of you watch Fox News at night? I know a lot of you do. What in the world would we do without Fox News, right? And, and I just have to say this, that I've had such a wonderful time you know, in my association with Fox News. I'm now a, a Fox News commentator. And, uh, you know, people are always asking me, what, you know, what is it like to be at Fox News? And I always just say, you know, what they see on TV is right. You know, fair, Fox News, fair, balanced, and blonde. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of, met a lot of beautiful women at Fox News, and it's a lot of... By the way, Fox News, I have some good news on that count, too. If you look at the, the, the major political news channels on TV today, and you look at the, the Nielsen ratings just came out recently, Fox News at night, ladies and gentlemen, Fox News at night now has a larger audience than CNN, MSNBC, and CNBC combined, combined. So that is, that is a fabulous thing um, that is going on. All right, so I want to th have some fun with you tonight, and I want to talk about some of the things that I I'm feeling most passionately about in terms of what's going on in Washington and uh, a little bit about what's happening in the state of Kansas. But I want to start, if I may, about talking the, about the issue that I, I just love talking about because it's such a great, great made in America story and a great, great reason to feel so upbeat about the future of our country. And what I'm talking about is the energy story in this country, which is just an amazing revolution that a lot of people haven't been paying full attention to, but this is something that is going to, that is already starting to dramatically change the direction of our economy, and it is, a, it is such a spectacular story of success. And I always like to start this story by saying that about a year and a half ago, I, I had been to every continental state in the United States multiple times, but I had never been to the state of North Dakota. How many of you have been to North Dakota, by the way? Ra raise your hand. Uh, about half of you have. You know, I had never been to North Dakota before. One of the lessons I learned is you don't go to North Dakota in February. <laughs> it was damn cold up there. I don't think it got above zero degrees when I, the four days I was there. But the, I went to this town of Williston, North Dakota. And most of you probably know why I went to Williston, North Dakota. Williston sits atop, ladies and gentlemen, of something called the Bakken Shale. And the Bakken Shale is the biggest oil find in North America in 50 years. And it is a spectacularly productive uh, uh, piece of land with huge amounts of oil and natural gas. And so I spent, uh, by the way, when you go to the town of Williston, North Dakota today, it was such an amazing experience. That town is growing faster and faster and faster every day. It feel, to go to Williston, North Dakota feels like what it must have been like during the gold rush days in California. 
quite literally. I mean, it, I had to, just to give you a sense of how fast that town is growing, I had to spend $659 to stay at a Best Western hotel in Williston, North Dakota, because there's no way to, where to stay. Uh, we had an article, front page of the Wall Street Journal, so it must be true, right, that it is booming so much in Williston, North Dakota, that even the strippers from Las Vegas are moving from Vegas to Williston because there's more business there. So, you know, it is, it is a, a boomtown USA, and I spent a couple of days with the geologists there who were explaining to me how they're getting at this oil and gas that has been trapped there in the shale rock formation for literally millions of years. And we've never had the technological capability at getting at that oil and gas. And thanks to these, these breakthroughs, it's an amazing thing. You stand out there in the middle of a wheat field in the Great Plains of, of, uh, of North Dakota, uh, and, and you're standing next to an oil rig, and to think that we now have the technological capability to drill two miles deep into the ground. And then because of this new technology called horizontal drilling, these rigs now go two miles deep in the ground, and then they can go like a spider web in any direction. So they can go you know, north, south, east, and west, and they can go two miles in any direction. So to think you're standing there, and two miles deep in the ground, and two miles away, they're drilling oil is just an amazing thing. And then, of course, because of this incredible invention that we know is hydraulic fracturing or fracking, uh, they now have the capability to, to uh, penetrate through this shale rock formation, which is it's like an armor plate. It's, it's oftentimes it's 18 inches to two uh, feet thick, and they're able to pulsate water and chemicals and sand into this rock. It's such a tribute to human innovation that they can actually do this. And they're able to crack through that shale rock. And once they do, ladies and gentlemen, it's like taking a champagne bottle and shaking up that champagne bottle and taking the cork off of it. The, the oil and gas that's been stored there for those millions of years goes to the top of the wells and, and uh, it's just an amazing thing. Now the reason uh, I've been telling you this, by the way, is very simple. Ladies and gentlemen, by some estimates, there is more oil in North Dakota than there is Saudi Arabia. Now, how cool is that? There is more oil in North Dakota than Saudi Arabia. And by the way, this is happening all over this country. I was so glad to learn, I forget who I was speaking to tonight during the cocktail reception, one of the gentlemen who's in the oil industry said that Kansas was the birthplace of hydraulic fracturing. Is that, is that true, Nestor? I, I mean, I heard that today, that this was, the first uh, fracturing wells were, were drilled here in the great state of Kansas. And it's not just happening in North Dakota, it's not just happening in Kansas, it's happening throughout on the East Coast where I live. States like uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio uh, are getting extraordinarily rich off of the Marcellus Shale. The Marcellus Shale, by the way, has 150 years worth of natural gas, 150 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not running out of oil and gas, we're running into it. We're running into it in a big, big way. And you go to these places like Wheeling, West Virginia, and these little towns of Pennsylvania that used to be so decrepit and, and, and uh, almost bankrupt, and now they are booming. It's such a spectacular thing to say. See, and one of the interesting parts of the story, one of my favorite parts of the story, is that because you have some very liberal states in this country, like California and New Jersey, and New York, these states have actually banned hydraulic fracturing. They've banned it, fra banned fracking. Now, let me just say this. To be against fracking is like being against a cure for cancer. I mean, that's how stupid this is. I mean, this is a process that is revolutionizing our country, but you know, these, these, some of these states are so in the hip pocket of the radical environmentalists, they have banned it. They don't allow fracking. Now, here's the fun part of the story. So, New York has banned fracking in upstate New York, which is craziness because upstate New York is a very economically depressed area. Places like Buffalo and places like Syracuse could really use the jobs and the economic development from fracking, but no, the digbats in Albany have said, no, we're not going to allow this. So here's the fun part of this story. You know what they're doing in Pennsylvania now, ladies and gentlemen? They're drilling down and then they're going horizontally under New York and they're taking out all their oil and gas and they're bringing it in. So I, I just love that part of the story. Now, why am I spending time talking about this? Because I believe, you know, I've been saying this for, for the last year or so and I, I like to take credit for being one of the first people to say this because now you're hearing a lot of economists and a lot of uh, engineer, uh, engineers in the uh, energy industry saying the same thing that Within 10 years, within 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America, this great, great country of ours, will move from being an oil and gas import country to an oil and gas export country. 
Now think about that. I mean, that is an amazing thing to think about. And when you think about this, by the way, that, that is not just a huge economic statement to make, which it is, by the way. What is the one thing the United States uh, imports more of than anything else in the world? Oil, right? We spend about 100, I mean, about 250 to 300 billion dollars a year importing oil from the rest of the world. That's money that's not being reinvested here. It's going to, uh, to countries abroad. And by the way, a lot of those countries are not necessarily nations that have America's national security at, at, uh, at, at, in terms of their interests. In fact, you'd make the case that a lot of these countries are hostile to the United States. Countries like uh, Venezuela, countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Iran. Now think about what a game changer this is for our national security that we now and very soon won't have to be spending tens of billions of dollars sending money to these countries that hate us. So that is a huge breakthrough. The other thing that's so neat about this is that because of things like the low natural gas price in the United States and hydraulic fracturing, the United States of America now today is the, has the lowest cost power of any other nation virtually in the world, especially any other industrialized nation that we compete with. We have lower cost power today than China does, than Germany does, than Japan does, than France does, than England does. This is a huge competitive advantage to the United States of America and our industries. And so one of the reasons I'm so upbeat about our economy and our, the future for our economy is we are seeing a mini renaissance, for example, in manufacturing in the United States. Factories are being rebuilt in this country right now. And one of the reasons for that is because you, the power is so much cheaper here than it is other places in the world. There was an article um, in the major German newspaper that, I, that I, somebody sent me just a week ago that major German manufacturing companies that because of Europe, you know, Europe has all these wacky um, renewable energy standards and all these, these stupid things that require them to, you know, get 25 and 30 percent of their energy production from, from uh, renewable energy. I, I hope, by the way, you don't have one of these dingbat, you don't have a renewable energy standard in Kansas. Please tell me you don't. Do you, Dave? Oh my God, you got to get rid of your renewable energy centers. Those are crazy. But anyways, then the story, German companies, German manufacturers are now looking at leaving Germany and coming to the United States because of the lower cost power here. How great is that? That means for the first time, we're actually insourcing manufacturing jobs rather than ex outsourcing them. So I'm very high on this story. I think it has just profound uh, impact on the American economy and all sorts of, uh, of industries. And by the way, uh, you know, while I'm on this topic of, of, uh, of renewable energy, I'm not against renewable energy. I know you've got a lot of wind power here in, in Kansas, and, and I'm not, you know, if you can produce wind power cost effectively, I'm all for it. Solar power, same thing if you're in Phoenix and you've got a lot of sunshine. But you know, I'll give you an amazing thing. If you want to get a sense of, of how crazy Washington, D.C. is, if you look over the last five years, the United States federal government has spent $100 billion of your and my tax dollars subsidizing the wind and the solar industry. $100 billion. After that five years of this, quote, $100 billion investment, anybody want to take a guess today in the United States, what percentage of our electricity production in the United States comes from wind and solar power? Anybody want to take a guess? I, I heard somebody say 3%. Uh, I heard somebody say 2%. We're at 2.5%. 2.5% of our electricity comes from wind and solar, and we've just spent $100 billion on this. Now, I want to just end this part of the story by telling you this. I love irony, you know, and politics is just full of irony. How is this for great irony? We have just reelected probably the, the, the greenest president in American history, right? I mean, Barack Obama is unquestionably more in the hip pocket of the radical environmental groups than any president, certainly in my lifetime. Um, and we also know, if those of you who are in the energy business, I, I met a number of you tonight who are, you know this, that, that there's probably never been a president who has been more hostile to fossil fuels than Barack Obama, right? I think you'd all agree with that statement. Here is the profound irony of Barack Obama, that in his eight years as president, he will have presided over the biggest oil and gas boom in American history. <laughs> Is that great or what? So, uh, so that's a cool part of the story. The second issue I wanted to bring up, if I may, 
is, uh, is this theme that Arthur Laffer, the great economist Arthur Laffer, who was Ronald Reagan's chief economist, um, he and I have been working on this book for the last few years um, that is about the states and, and why are some states growing so rapidly and why are other states falling behind? And, and we've really spent a lot of time on this. And, and the one really interesting thing, if you look at the last two election cycles, the, 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 probably the most important story about what's going on in America politically, especially in these last two election cycles, is that the red states of America, like Kansas, are getting redder, and the blue states of America are getting bluer. I live, I, my hometown is Illinois. Illinois has become, you know, more of a blue state than, than just about any other state in the country. When I was growing up in Illinois, Illinois was a very competitive state. We'd swing, you know, uh, Republican and Democrat no more. You know, Illinois just uh, practically tripled its, its income tax. Uh, Mitch Daniels, the former uh, governor of Indiana, said when we raised our income tax in, in Illinois, he said, uh, living next to the uh, to the state of Illinois is like living down the street from the Simpsons. <laughs> you know, and I always thought that was a great comment. But so you've got, what you've got going on in America today is red states that, uh, and just look at, especially in Dixie, look at the states uh, in, the, in the south. Those states have become almost entirely red. And, and you know, by the way, that's quite a transformation. 25 and 30 years ago, the so states south of the Mason-Dixon line were all pretty much blue. Those were the, the old Dixie Democrats. Now those states are completely red. And the same thing if you look at Oklahoma and Kansas and, and then other pro-growth states like Utah, they have become you know, incredibly red. Meanwhile, the blue states, and, and if you think about the big blue states, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, they are moving in exactly the opposite direction politically. They elected more and more Democrats. Now, why is this important? Why is this story important? Because one of the premises of our book is that you've got these two economic models that are now being put to the test in the states. The blue states of America, the states like Massachusetts and Illinois and New York and New Jersey and California, what they are doing, ladies and gentlemen, is they are adopting Obamanomics, right? They're very pro labor union, huge pension obligations, raising their income tax rates, doing all of the things that progressive Democrats and liberals believe makes for prosperity. Meanwhile, the red states of this country are pra practicing Reaganomics, right? Reaganomics. They're cutting their taxes, they're getting more efficient in their provision of government services. They're taking on the unions. They're fixing their pension programs. They're right to work states. All of these things matter. Now, if, if we are right in terms of what our book is about, one of the things that we predict is going to happen, by the way, one of the things we predict, and one of the reasons Kansas has to move so aggressively towards being a no-income tax state, we predict that within 10 years, the entire southern region of the United States, all of the old confederacy states, if you will, that, that entire region of the country will be an income tax-free zone and the income taxes will be, well, that's a pretty cool thing, right? An entire region of the country will not have income taxes. Now, I, I want so badly, I want so badly for Kansas to abolish its income tax. Today in America, and this is why, this is another reason I felt so uh, compelled to come here and talk to you tonight. There are nine states, ladies and gentlemen, there are nine states in this country, as Dave was talking about, that have no income tax. I mean, this isn't some kind of, how, how in the world could we possibly survive with a non-income tax? There are nine states that do it, and they do have good schools, and they do have good roads, and they do have good hospitals, and they do have good government services. They're able to provide those things without a state income tax. And that includes, as Dave was talking about, states like Texas, states like Florida, states like New Hampshire, states like Tennessee, and those states are actually booming, and it isn't happening by accident. It isn't happening by accident. And by the way, it's not just happening by the, because of the weather either. I mean, I always get these arguments when I, when I debate these liberals. They say, well, of course, you know, people are moving to Florida. Florida is a great, you know, state to go to and all the snowbirds can go to Florida for the, for, the, for the winter. And obviously, Florida has a big advantage because of its weather, no question about it, and its beaches. But that is not the explanation for why the no-income tax states are doing so well because here is an amazing statistic to think about, folks. If you look over the last six years, one of the most amazing transfers of wealth in the history of our country has happened in the last six years. And it's a massive wealth transfer from the state of California to the state of Texas. If you look over the last six years, 
California has lost just short of one million jobs. One million jobs have left the Golden State. In that six-year period, one million new jobs have shown up in the state of Texas. Now, I guarantee you that people are not moving from San Diego, California to Houston, Texas because of the weather. <laughs> They're just not doing that, right? They are doing that because Texas is a pro-growth state and California is out in Never Never Land, right? And so this is, has profound implications for the great state of Kansas. And by the way, Speaker Ray, may I just speak to you for a moment? If you will help us abolish this state income tax, and, and I know you want to do this, we will, we will put Speaker Ray for president as our lead editorial in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, we will do that because Kansas has got to be the 10th state that operates with no income tax. And I, I, that is a promise to you, sir, and I know you can get this done. So, so this is a, a, a great story, and I, I really hope that you will do it. Uh, and, you know, I know that you've got a plan to phase this out over 10 or 15 years. No, not 10 or 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do this in 2013 in 2014. So that's a, that is a great thing. Let me just ask you, you know, I am so, what, Dave asked me to say a word or two about this IRS scandal. And by the way, one of the reasons you know the Kansas Policy Institute is making a big impact, they were just audited by the IRS. So congratulations, Dave. That is a badge of honor these days, right? No, I'm actually making that up. I don't know if they were audited or not. But you know, what is going on right now? I, I think it's so interesting how confused liberals are about this scandal. You know, what they're saying is, well, you know, these are groups that probably shouldn't have their 501c4 status, and these are political groups anyway, and we hate Karl Rove, and, and they shouldn't be doing this, and, 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 you know, they're involved in electioneering anyway, so they shouldn't have their 501c4 status, and they shouldn't be a tax-exempt organization. And, and I always say to these liberals on these shows, fine. If you want to get rid of the 501c4 status of these organizations, fine. But then you have to get rid of the 501c4 status for every liberal group. Right? And they don't want to do that, right? I mean, look, I'm, all I care about, I used to run a super PAC. I ran one of the first super PACs in this country, raised a lot of money. We raised about $25 million a year. My point was make the rules fair for both sides. Now, here is the thing that is so scary. Here is what is so scary, though, about this scandal. There is no question, if you, when you get to the bottom of this and you ask really what was happening, what was happening is this administration, and this goes, I believe, to the very top. My, my, uh, my uh, colleague, Kim Strassel, has run a number of great columns on this, that this starts from the very top. It starts from the Oval Office. And what Barack Obama has been doing for the last five years through agencies like the IRS is creating an enemies list, right? That's what this is about. They created an enemies list, and one of the things that they did, and I know a lot of the people who run these organizations, these conservative groups, is what they were doing was denying them their tax-exempt status so they could not operate in the six months before the election. Now, that's an outrage. Right? That basically meant we were disarming ourselves in one of the most important elections of our lifetimes. And n never were any of those liberal groups challenged. And by the way, they were saying things like Tea Party, Patriot. The word Patriot was, was viewed as an enemy term. I mean, how does that happen in this country of ours? And by the way, one other thing. This wasn't just happening at the IRS. This, was ha this is happening every single day in America, this abuse of power in Washington. It's happening in OSHA, it's happening at the EPA, it's happening at the Federal Trade Commission. Every single one of these institutions, these regulatory agencies, is abusing their power and going after conservatives and those of us who believe in the free market ideas. And we have to rise up as a movement and say, enough. This has got to stop. You know, I have a great um, cartoon, one of those old cartoon, uh, Peanuts cartoons on my wall in my office. And it says, uh, remember when Snoopy used to sit on the top of his doghouse and type out messages on his typewriter? And this one is so classic. It says, Dear IRS, please take me off your mail list. You know? <laughs> and that's the way I feel every day. Now, I want to do a quick quiz, if I may, or kind of a sample of you in this room, because I have devoted most of my life, in terms of being an economist, 
to doing exactly what you're trying to do here in the great state of Kansas, which is to try to deal with this beast of our federal tax system. Because the truth is, if we could clean up this tax system, if we could either get rid of the income tax entirely or move towards something like a flat rate income tax, like Steve Forbes and Dick Army talked about, remember when Steve Forbes ran for president, on the idea of the flat tax. If you could eliminate all of the deductions and carve-outs and special interest provisions in the tax code and get rid of all that pollution and make it so squeaky clean and so simple, guess what? You wouldn't need an IRS infrastructure, right? You wouldn't need an IRS that has 100,000 agents snooping on us. So I want to ask you all, and I've really been pondering this for years myself, and I want to ask you all this. If you had three options uh, to fix our tax system, and option number one was to move towards the flat tax, which is the postcard tax return, 18% tax rate, get rid of all the deductions, carve out, special interest provision, get rid of all of that stuff, no double tax on savings, so you no, no uh, estate tax, no capital gains tax, no dividend tax, none of that stuff. Uh, you know, you've got a simple reform, doesn't double tax your saving, that would be option number one, the, uh, the flat tax. The second idea is maybe even a little bit more profound and radical, and that is the idea of abolishing the state income tax entirely. I mean, the, the, the state income, the federal income tax, to basically repeal the 16th Amendment and, re, and, uh, and get rid of our federal income tax and adopt a national sales tax. How many of you heard of this idea of like the, the fair tax? A, a lot of you have. Uh, and that would basically mean no federal income tax, no federal corporate income tax, no capital gains tax, no dividend tax. All of those taxes would be completely eliminated. It would no longer be the IRS's business how much money you make because you wouldn't have to fill out tax forms. Uh, and you would simply replace that with about an 18% national sales tax that you just pay at the cash register. You buy a car, you pay an 18% tax. You buy a grape slurpee at the 7-Eleven, you pay an 18% tax. But no income tax. And the third option, is to keep the tax system pretty much the way it is. Now I want to, I would love as a show, show of hands, if those are the three options, how many of you in this room would choose the flat tax? Ra raise your hand if you're a flat tax person. Gosh, about, it looks like about 70% of you. How many of you like the, the idea of abolishing the federal income tax and having a national sales tax? Gosh, some of you are raising your hands twice, <laughs> but uh, okay, so maybe about a third of you. How many of you like the tax system just about the way it is? I, I was actually, when I, I gotta say this, when I was out in Boston um, a, a few weeks ago giving a talk at a convention, I asked the same question. This guy in the back of the room was wildly raising his hand when I said, who likes the system just the way it is? They say, sir, what do you do for a living? I'm a tax accountant. You know, so of course he liked the system the way it is. Uh, but this is, you know, this is the time. One of the things I told the House Republicans, I just spoke at their retreat two weeks ago in West Virginia, I said, now is the time. Now is the time to really be talking about using the backdrop of this IRS scandal to reform that income tax. How many of you are with me on this? I mean, how many of you want to see a fundamental reform of the system? We've got to deal with that. Um, the next thing I want to bring out, and I, and I promise I'm coming to the end here, but, I, but I, these are such important issues. I, wa I wanted to just speak about each one. Obamacare. Uh, Obamacare is, in my opinion, maybe the worst legislation ever passed in the history of this country. I mean, this, this law is such a disgrace. And, you know, I, I want to talk about a couple aspects of it. One is that this, this plan, it was sold to us as Americans as a plan that would bend the cost curve down. Remember, this was going to reduce the cost of health care, and we're going to provide health care for everybody, and it's going to be cheaper for everyone. Well, that is not happening. That is not happening. We see more and more evidence of that every single day. And what is happening, I don't know if you saw the article uh, just about two weeks ago, I was on Fox News talking about this a couple weeks ago, that the average family of four for a, for a normal premium plan, for a normal health insurance coverage plan, now costs $20,000 a year for a family of four. 
Who in the world can afford that? If you're living on a $65,000 income, how can you afford a $20,000 health care plan? You simply can't. And those costs are going up and up and every year. And one of the reasons, by the way, they're going up so much under Obamacare is Obamacare mandates all of these new forms of coverage. So that what's happening is you can't go out there, especially the young people. I met a lot of young people in this room. If you're a young person, you can't go out there and purchase health, a cheap health insurance plan because now the government is mandating mandating that you get all of these uh, various kinds of, uh, of coverage. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, if I may, let me applaud you for the two things that you have done with the help of the governor and all the other legislators in this state. And they deserve a great round of applause for number one, rejecting the state exchanges. Thank you for doing that, uh, Mr. Speaker. And number two, and I think you're almost there, please, 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 please do not be seduced into taking this Obamacare Medicaid money because it's gonna come back and bite you right in the ass. So please don't take that. Anything, you know, the lesson that I have learned is that whenever Washington is offering something for free, it is not free. And you will end up regretting it two years or three years or five years from now if you take that money. So I appreciate very much, sir, your leadership on that issue. But I wanna bring up another point about Obamacare that I think is so incredibly pernicious. And that is what Obamacare is doing to our country with respect to employment. And this is something a lot of people didn't think about when they passed this law. But how many of you in this room have ever heard of the term a 49er? And I'm not, I'm not talking about a San Francisco 49er. How many of you have heard the term a 49er? I, I see a few of you have. A 49er, for those of you who have not heard this term, and by the way, I guarantee you, over the next six months and a year, you're gonna be very familiar with this term. A 49er is a business that has capped their employment at 49 workers. They, those are businesses that will not hire a 50th worker. And by the way, there are a lot of businessmen and women I talk to who have maybe 60 workers or 65 workers or 55 workers. They're actually laying off workers so they can get below 50 workers. Now, why are businesses doing that? Why are they keeping their employment level below 50 workers? And the answer, I think, is all of you in this room know, because under this new Obamacare abomination bill, any employer that has more than 50 workers is subject to these new enormously costful, costly mandates. It means you have to provide all of these new health care coverage plans to your employees. And this is extraordinarily expensive to employees. They simply won't hire people more than 50. I gave a talk um, a few weeks ago to the, uh, the National uh, 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 Restaurant Association, and these were people who own McDonald's and Burger King's and Red Lobsters and, and you know, major restaurants in this country. And by the way, the fast food restaurant in this country, uh, that industry employs about 20 million workers, so that is one of the major employers in this country. And, and all of these people, almost all of them said they are not going to hire 50 workers. And the other interesting thing about this bill that is so insidious is that it also defines as a full-time worker, anyone who works more than 30 hours a week. Now, by the way, I don't know when in this country 30 hours a work week became a full-time job, but that's how the Obamacare legislation defines it. And so what's interesting is now guess how what employers are doing. And this is a very harmful thing to the American worker and the American family. Now businesses are hiring people at these restaurants and retail establishment and, and other places, they're hiring people for just 28 hours a week. And that's to keep under the 30 hour a week maximum. Uh, in fact, so much so, when I was giving that talk to the retail, uh, the restaurant association, a couple of people came up to me afterwards and they said, Steve, it's much worse than you think. And these guys, one of them was in Houston, one of them owned Burger Kings and the other one owned Wendy's. And you know what they're doing now, ladies and gentlemen? The Burger King employees are working 20 hours a week at the Burger King, then they're going across the street and working 20 hours a week at the Wendy's, and the Wendy's employees are going 20 hours a week you know, in the morning at the Wendy's, and then they're going across the street to Burger King. And they're doing that to maintain their employment below the 20 hours, I mean below the 30 hours a week. So this law is having an incredibly negative effect on employment. Now here is the good news, I'm, I'm here to bring good news tonight. Here is the good news about that law, I believe I believe that within two years, the Obamacare law is going to become completely unraveled. 
Uh, I, I think that law is not going to stand, and I think it will be repealed by the United States Congress, and I think you're going to see enough people, you're going to see a, such a groundswell of support to get rid of this law that I think you will even have a veto-proof majority to get rid of Obamacare. Now, I, you know, in fact, when I talked to the House Republicans about this, one of the things I told them, because Republicans, with all due respect to the Republican lawmakers in this room, one of the things the Republicans are so terrible about Terrible. Uh, you know, they're awful at messaging, right? That's the problem with the Republican Party. They just can't message very well. And so what I told them, and I think you'll all appreciate this, I told these, these men and women in this room, there were about 150 of the House Republicans there, I said, whatever you're doing, whenever you're on Fox News or CNN or CNBC or whether you're on talk radio, whether you're on Rush Limbaugh or your local radio station or whether you're in before the Kiwanis Club or the, you know, whatever meeting you're in, no matter any time you're dealing with your constituents, no matter what the question is, no matter what question you are asked, the first answer is always the first thing we have to do is repeal Obamacare, right? And that is that is really true. That is the top priority for our country right now. So let me just conclude this by saying that um, I do believe that this great country of ours, I think we are going to see an incredible economic renaissance. I'm really bullish about the economy. If you look at our private companies in the United States, they are so lean, mean, and efficient right now. It's amazing how efficient our American companies came, became after the terrible recession of 2008 and 9. They deleveraged, they got rid of excess of costs. They are incredibly productive right now. Um, they're reluctant to hire workers because they don't know when the next shoe is going to drop in Washington. But I would say to you that other than Obamacare, the other biggest cancer in our economy right now is this national debt. And this, I, I'm not telling you anything that you don't all know in this room. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know this. But I just want to recite a couple of these statistics because I think it is so important that we as a crusade, as patriots, as people who care about our kids and grandkids, that we all make a commitment to doing something about this enormous debt. And just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, you know, the numbers become so gigantic in Washington that we can't even really comprehend them anymore. But in just the last four years, the United States government has borrowed five trillion dollars. Five trillion dollars in four years. Now you might think, well, what does that mean? These numbers are so big. You know, by the way, there's a saying in Washington that the trillion is the new billion, and it really is true. I mean, it's only in the last few years we even started talking about the budget and the trillions of dollars. But to give you a sense of how big these numbers are, five trillion dollars is more money than the United States government borrowed from 1776 through the year 2000. That's amazing when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, I'm aghast at how much our country has faltered. That means in four years, we borrowed more money than we borrowed to finance the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, and the Cold War. Astonishing, right? Astonishing. Part of the reason, how many of you would say you're angry about these, these numbers and really angry about the debt? I mean, I'm almost everybody, right? Now, here's the amazing thing. The reason people aren't even angrier is because they can't comprehend the numbers. I, I always tell the story, you know, I've, I have three sons. I have uh, two teenagers who I don't like very much, but I have an 11-year-old who I'm very fond of. And so when I'm at home at night, I try to tell my 11-year-old a bedtime story. And so one night, uh, a few months ago, I thought I'd tell him a story about the national debt, because after all, he's going to have to repay it, so I thought he should know something about it. So I said, David, do you know how much a trillion dollars is? and his eyes totally glazed over. So I said, well, David, uh, who's the greatest basketball player in the world? And he's playing very soon, in a few minutes. LeBron James. And so uh, I said, then I said to David, well, David, how much money does LeBron James make every year? And he knew the answer to this. He, he has this encyclopedic, he's not a very good student, but he knows everything there is to know about the NBA. He knew that LeBron James makes $40 million a season. $40 million a year. Is this a great country or what? You can make $40 million a year to play basketball. So then I posed this question to my son David, but I'll pose the same one to you all. I said, David, how many seasons do you think LeBron James would have to play basketball at $40 million a season to have a trillion dollars? To have a trillion dollars. Anybody know the answer to that? 25,000 seasons. 
25,000 seasons. So these numbers are gigantic. And these are costs that are going to be absorbed by our kids and our grandkids uh, and so on. Uh, by the way, I have this one. I think you'll all appreciate this. Some of you may have seen this. I have this wonderful bumper sticker on my car. It says, thank God Barack Obama doesn't know what comes after a trillion. <laughs> you know, because the numbers are so big. I mean, whew. But, uh, but I mean, th this is really a, a, quite a crisis. And, and I, I really feel very passionately about this, that every generation in this country has had, had some calling, right? You know, you go back to the, 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 the founding fathers who fought for our liberty and our freedoms and, and the, the generation who fought to end the, the scourge and the evils of slavery and then, you know, the, the generation that, that fought the great war, World War I, and, and then, of course, the, what we call the my fathers and many of the people in this room's generation, the, what we call the greatest generation, the generation that, that uh, got us out of the, the Great Depression and, and, and defeated the Nazis and the, and, the, and the Japanese, and then, of course, the, the generation that just uh, won the Cold War for us. What I always tell these young people is your calling, your calling in life, and your mission as a generation, the generation Xers and Yers, your generation will be to, de to deal with this enormous debt crisis because that is the one thing that is holding back our country. Now, I do believe this is going to happen, by the way. I think the American people are really ready for a revolution when it comes to dealing with the overspending problem. And you got to do two things to deal with the debt. You got to grow the economy like crazy, right? You got to have much faster growth. This has been the lamest recovery from a recession we've seen since the Great Depression. And it's because everything in Washington we have done in the last five years has been exactly the wrong thing to do. Uh, but the other thing you have to do is you have to start cutting some spending. Right? Uh, when I was on one of the, you saw that clip when I was on one of these TV shows not long ago, MSNBC, they said, Steve, can you mention four government programs that you'd want to get rid of? And I said, that's easy. Department of Education, Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, and Department of uh, uh, the, the EPA. Is that so hard? Right? You know, I mean, so we can get rid of a lot of these things and we can live without them. Um, the last point I will say is it's all about competitiveness. It's all about making America uh, the most competitive nation in the world. We are living in a nation in a world now on a planet where everyone is competing with everyone around the world. Kids in Kansas, when you graduate kids from your high schools and colleges here, they are not just competing against kids from Oklahoma and, and, and New York and California and Illinois. Your kids are competing against everybody in the world. This is a truly global planet right now where everyone is competing with, another, with one another. And the central challenge we have as Americans now is to make sure that we maintain our competitive edge. Uh, and that's, I would make the case, Mr. Speaker, that's your challenge in Kansas, to make sure that you make a state that is at the cutting edge of, of, of competition. Now, here's the issue. We have, for the last 75 years, you all know this, for the last 75 years, the United States has been the global economic superpower, right? And I would make the case to you that we have been a force for good, not evil. We've been, you know, we led the world in technology and wealth creation and jobs. Uh, we have also been the military superpower, keeping the planet safe. Um, but now for the first time in any of our lifetimes, we do have a rival, right? We have a rival who's nipping at our heels, and of course, that is China. And this is, a, this is the real thing. Those guys are catching up to us, right? And they've got their sights on us. We had a meeting with the economic minister of China about a year ago. This was the guy number four in the chain of command of Beijing. You know, he's a big wig in, in Beijing. He comes to New York in our editorial meeting and meets before the editorial board and talking about how wonderful everything is in China. And by the way, if you want evidence of how superior the capitalist free market system is to socialism. Just look what's happened in China over the last 25 years. One of the great miracles of human history, how that nation has turned itself around. A nation that for hundreds of years couldn't even feed itself is now becoming a global economic superpower. And this gentleman is very arrogant. He said within eight years, he said by the year 2019, he said China is going to catch the United States. And he said, and once we do, we're just going to leave you people in a cloud of dust. We're just going to, we're just going to sprint right past you. And uh, you all don't know me all that well, but if you cut me, I bleed red, white, and blue. So I couldn't take this much longer from this, from this gentleman. So I kind of sprang up out of my chair and it kind of, kind of uh, alarmed him. But I, I just said, sir, you know, I, I've listened very intently to everything you've said, and I really want to salute you for what you've done in terms of turning around your economy. I said, but not in my lifetime, sir. Will China catch the United States. And I said, the reason I can tell you that with all certainty is because our Chinese are so much smarter than your Chinese. <laughs> you know, he, he, didn't like, he didn't like that very much, but it is true. And so my message to you all tonight is please 
let us make the United States of America the most competitive nation in the world, and sir, let us make Kansas the most competitive state in this great country of ours. Thank you very much for helping this great organization. It's been a great privilege to be with you tonight. Thank you.